Hey everyone, so today we're going to talk about how to create a three-point lighting setup in order to simulate like a studio lighting environment. So I have this car right here and the first thing I want to do is I want to see the textures that I've applied to it. So in Blender you have a couple of different viewport modes and those can be found up here in the top right hand side of your screen. The first is wireframe mode, and that allows you to see your topology pretty easily. Um, the second is kind of what you're probably most used to, and this is just kind of a fake shading so that if you're modeling, you can see the forms of your object. The next one to the right is the material preview mode. So this gives you an approximation of what your materials are going to look like. One thing to note though, is this is not what's going to be rendered out. If you wanna see what Blender's going to render out, you need to go one more to the right. And this is your render preview mode. Now, as you can see, the lighting is not great and that's because we actually don't have any lights in our scene. We're talking about a three point lighting setup, which is the most basic and most versatile system to light your objects and create a really professional effect. So before we jump into those lights, let's come over to our basic shading viewport. The first thing I wanna add is I wanna add an infinite background. And that's essentially what you see when you go for a photo shoot. It's just like a piece of paper that slowly slopes upward so that you can't see any creases. And creating one of those in Blender is pretty easy. So I'm gonna start by just adding a plane and I'm gonna scale that up. And then I'm going to choose an edge and extra that edge up. And then I'm going to find this crease here. If I click Control B, that will let me bevel the edge. And you can see it's, it's not sloping. And that's because there, there are no extra cuts in this bevel. So if I come back down to this bevel drop down here, I can just increase the segments and it will slope itself out. And the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up to object, click shade smooth. That way we don't see any of the steps of our edges there. And now we have an infinite background. And with that solved, again, before we jump into the lights, I just wanna place my camera in scene. So I'm gonna click shift A and select camera. So you can see it added the camera right in the middle of our scene. If I click zero on the number pad or click this camera button up here, we can toggle in and out of our camera. What we can also do is if we come to this side pullout, we can come over to view and we can select camera to view. And what that will do is it will navigate our camera based on how we're navigating around the scene. So I'm just gonna position my camera about where I want, okay. Now this is gonna be how our car gets rendered out. And now we can jump into lighting. When I start to light a scene, I like to have two viewports on my screen. That way I can keep one viewport focused on my camera while the other viewport can be focused on navigation. So in order to split screens, I'm going to bring my cursor up here and just drag out. And I'm going to check off camera to view just so I don't accidentally move it. Okay, so now this is going to be my render view, but I can break away from this camera and move around. And on this left-hand side, I'm going to change this view to render preview. Again, just so we can get a sense of what our final image is gonna look like. Now, right off the bat, you can see there's some amount of lighting in our scene. Blender blanket lights your scene using a specific color in order to give kind of a general amount of lighting and definition. I don't really want that because I want the lights to have the most control in my scene. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the strength down to zero. And now we can see the car is completely gone and our lights will have the most control. Okay, so let's add our first light. And so I'm going to click Shift A, come down to lights. 90% of the time I use area lights. I find they're the most easy to use and they get the best result. So I'm gonna add an area light. I'm going to pull that light above my car. Now you can see the light's fairly small. I'm going to increase the size of that just by scaling it up. And then I'm gonna come over to my light parameter. And you see in our light parameters, we can change the intensity of the light using the power, but we can also change the color of our light if we want. I'm gonna keep it just to a white light, but I'm gonna set the power to 300 maybe. Okay, now we have our first light in our three-point lighting setup, and this light is called the rim light or the back light. And it generally either sits on top of your subject or to the back and tilted towards the back of your subject. And this light's main job is to separate the subject from the background of our scene. 
So I'll kind of put this right here. And like we said, it's called a rim light. And so we should see some halos around the edges of the car that separate it from this white texture in the back. Now with that added, I'm going to add what's called a fill light. And the fill light's job is to light the majority of our object. So I'm gonna point it just to one side of my car. I'm gonna bring the power up to 400. Generally, the fill light is more powerful than the other lights in your scene. So maybe I'll bring this down to 200 and then bring our backlight down to 150. I feel like that needs to be a little bit stronger. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So we have the backlight and we have the key light. And the last light we need to add is called the fill light. And the fill light's job is you see with our key light, it's creating a lot of contrast and dark shadows on the left-hand side of our car. The job of the fill light is just to fill out any of those shadows that we don't want to be dark. So if we bring this up, kind of point it in the direction we want, put it here, and I'll bring this up to maybe 100 watts. Okay, so that's, that's a pretty good lighting setup. And again, this is kind of the most basic form of studio lighting. And as you light different objects or scenes, you might start with a three-point lighting setup and then modify it and change it depending on the needs of your project. Okay, now that we have the lighting basically figured out, let's take a look at the camera. So if we select our camera, come down to the camera parameters here, we have a couple of different options that dictate how this camera works. The most dramatic option is the focal length. The focal length on a camera dictates the amount of perspective on a shot. And so the lower your focal length is, the more of the scene your camera is going to capture, um, but the more dramatic the perspective of your scene is going to be. Whereas we, if we bring it to 200, you can see it captures less of your scene but there's a lot less perspective in your scene. Generally, the rule of thumb is that 50 millimeters is approximately what a human eye's focal length is. For this project, I might bring it up to like 70. See how that looks? I like that. Okay, so now that we have that, so if we duplicate this car and move it behind our main subject, I wanna talk about depth of field real quick. So we have our camera, but you see that we can see this back car in perfect resolution compared to this front car here. The reason that is, is because we don't have depth of field enabled. And depth of field on a camera is what dictates if the background is blurry or not blurry. So if we come over to our camera settings here, we have this checkbox that says depth of field. You can see not much has happened, but if we click on this eyedropper tool and select part of our car, we can see something very subtle has happened. And the reason not much has happened is because we need to change the f-stop of our camera, which controls the aperture, which controls the depth of field um, in order to see any, any changes. So you can find the f-stop underneath the aperture dropdown. You can see by default, it's set to 2.8. Now, most cameras don't go beneath 2.6. And this is a situation where Blender's not quite realistic to real world situations. Generally, in order to get any effect, you have to bring it a fair amount below two. So you can see I bring it down to 0.1 and it makes it super blurry, but if I kind of just tick it up till it's about where I want it to be, you can dictate how shallow your depth of field is gonna be. One thing you should keep in mind when it comes to Blender is that Blender has two types of render engines. Now a render engine works to calculate the light in your scene. So each of these lights that we've put into our scene are shooting out what are basically fake photons and they bounce around our scene. And the render engine is calculating the paths in different ways to give you a final result. You can find the render engines within Blender if you come up to the Render Properties tab and you can look under Render Engine. And you can see we're using Cycles. By default, the render engine is going to be set to EV, and you can see there's a pretty big difference between the two render engines. There are pros and cons to each. EV is much faster at calculating light than Cycles is, but as you can see, Cycles is much more photorealistic and also more intuitive to use than EV is. So I'd recommend if you're going for a photorealistic look to use Cycles as much as possible. And that's what I'm gonna do here. 
Now, the last thing I want to go over before I show how to actually render an object in Blender is Blender's composition guides. So if we click on our camera again and come to the camera settings here, and if we scroll down to viewport display, we have a couple of really useful options. The first is the pass plateau, and that basically just dictates the opacity of your viewport outside of the camera view is going to be. So if we bring the pass plateau all the way up, you can see everything outside of our camera view is completely dark. And sometimes that just helps you figure out a composition a lot better. Another thing that's useful is you see under the pass plateau, we have composition guides. And these are just overlays that allow you to use different ratios to work out your composition. And none of this is going to actually be rendered out in your scene, but it can be really useful as you're putting objects in your scene to refine exactly where you want things to go. Okay, so once we have our scene composed the way we want and the scene lit how we want, all we need to do now is render our image. Now, if we come up to this output folder here, there's an option for outputting your, your renders. However, this is generally used for when you have an image sequence or an animation. So if you're just rendering out a single image, you might not need to use this. Since I'm just rendering out a single image, I'm going to keep my camera here and I'm gonna come up to render and click render image. And just like that, Blender's rendered our image and we're able to save it. In order to save an image, we just go up to image, save as, and find where we want it to go. Obviously name it, to, name it what you want. And we save the image. Let's just make sure it's in there. Yep, there we go. Our image is saved, it's rendered, and we're ready to go. So as you can see, the three-point lighting setup's a pretty simple process. And there's always something you can expand on in this process. And so I'd, I'd recommend practicing going through the three-point lighting setup, but also experimenting with adding another light, taking away a light, and just get a sense for how it affects your entire composition. Because ultimately, the final image is what's important. And as long as you have good composition and good lighting, it doesn't matter if you use a three-point lighting system or not. It's just a very good starting place. So thanks, guys. I'll talk to you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.